The problem with low-budget movies that become unexpected hits is that before you know it, the pressure's on to produce a sequel that can capitalise on their momentum and generate more of that sweet, sweet box office revenue. And so it was with Pitch Black, an unpretentious sci-fi horror movie about a group of survivors trying to find a way off a desolate planet while being hunted by alien monsters that only come out after dark. It was a neat movie with a cool premise that made the most of a pretty limited budget and even threw in a few surprises along the way. More importantly, it also introduced us to Richard B. Riddick, a convicted felon forced to work with the survivors that gradually redeems himself and becomes an unlikely anti-hero by the end. A sequel was as inevitable as a Disney live-action remake being a disappointing pile of shit. The only question was what to do with it. I mean, considering Riddick comes from a criminal background and he's still a wanted fugitive, you might think it would make sense to put him in some kind of action heist thriller, maybe have him recruited by a criminal gang to do a job that goes wrong and force him to fight for survival, or get involved in some shady government conspiracy, or maybe get hired by some plucky resistance fighters to help free a city being ruled by a corrupt dictator. There's a million different things you could do with a character like Riddick, but probably the last thing on your list would be to wreck on half of his backstory and awkwardly shoehorn him into an epic space fantasy story with magical wizards, ancient mythical warrior races, and armies of death worshipping space marines led by an undead sorcerer that can literally tear people's souls out of their bodies. But for some reason, Vin Diesel seemed to think it was a good idea, which is why we ended up with The Chronicles of Riddick, a bonkers, pretentious, overstuffed farce of a movie that basically abandons everything good about its predecessor and tries to convert it into Lord of the Rings in space. The movie picks up about five years after the events of Pitch Black, and the moment the opening monologue kicks in, you know something's gone seriously wrong. An army of death-worshipping nutjobs called Necromongers are spreading across the galaxy like a plague, recruiting and conquering everyone in their path while searching for a place known as the Underverse. They're led by the Lord Marshal, who went to the Underverse already and turned into a kind of demon sorcerer thing that can teleport himself through space to have really shitty CGI fights scenes with Vin Diesel. <laughs> Flawless. You know, I have a few questions about these guys. Why do they waste time conquering planets when their main objective is to reach the Underverse? How does planetary conquest further that goal? Isn't that just a massive waste of time and resources? It's implied that they force local populations to join their ranks, but why? They already have a massive space armada and an army numbering in the tens of millions. Do they really need more people? Also, why exactly do they need to search for the Underverse when the Lord Marshal's already been there? Did he forget where it was? How did he get there in the first place? then? And what exactly are they planning to do once they reach this place? Retire and sit by the pool? Also, it's not like the necromongers are mindless obedient zombies here. They seem to have their own personalities and free will. They can even form relationships and get married. Carl Urban even has a naggy wife that keeps telling him to kill the Lord Marshal so he can take over the necromongers. What's this? Tandy Newton portraying a smug, arrogant arsehole with a perpetual smirk on her face? Imagine my shock. If it was me, I'd be like, fuck that, you can fight the undead sorcerer and get your soul torn out. I'll be at the pool if you need me. Anyway, whatsoever. Flash over to random ice planet and Rastafarian Riddick is being tracked by a group of bounty hunters. But naturally he gets the better of them because... Vin Diesel. And he's able to trace the bounty back to diverse paradise planet where he reunites with Keith David from the first movie. Keith David reckons that Riddick is a Nick Furian, an ancient warrior race that was supposed to have gone extinct centuries ago. And there's an ancient prophecy that says a Nick Furian will be the one to kill the Lord Marshal because there's always a fucking prophecy prophecy in these things. But anyway, Riddick's like, nah, it'll be fine. He wants to know what happened to Jack from the first movie. Remember him? I mean, uh, her? Well, she wanted to follow in Riddick's footsteps, so she became a criminal, got arrested, and sent to a prison planet called Crematoria. Fucking really? I mean, I know she was kind of impressed by his shiny eyes in the first movie, but I always figured it was because he was just generally cool and badass, and she wanted to be like him. But nah, apparently she wants those shiny eyes real bad. Like she was willing to give up her entire future just to get sent to a place where she can get them. You realise Riddick's basically blind in normal lighting conditions without his goggles, right? Doesn't really seem like a worthwhile trade to me, but whatever. 
So wouldn't you know it, the Necromongers show up and invade the planet. Wow, talk about convenient timing. He's only been there for like a day. Also, I have to admit this scene still leaves me scratching my head. I mean, there's a bunch of cool visuals that were clearly inspired by a certain other war that was going on at the time. But there's no real sense of progression or balance here. I've got no idea which side's winning or losing. It's just a bunch of chaotic stuff blowing up. Anyway, Keith David gets killed in the fighting, and I guess the Necromongers take control of the planet, but then Riddick shows up the next day to take revenge on the guy who killed him, because he's still got the fucking knife sticking out of his back. What the fuck? You never bothered to pull it out? I know Necromongers don't feel pain in the same way that we do, but they can still take physical damage. And a giant knife impaled in your body it must be pretty fucking inconvenient when it comes to moving around. And I have to question what Riddick's plan was here to be honest. Like, he just walks into the room and challenges the guy to a fight. What makes you think they'll indulge this kind of bullshit and not just immediately kill you? I mean, these guys think in terms of galactic conquest. Do you really think they'll stop everything? just to indulge some random arsehole's challenge. Anyway, whatever. So he kills the guy and gets captured, and these weird ghost things come out of the wall to scan his mind, and they figure out that he's a Nick Furian. Uh-oh, busted. But before they can kill him, he escapes when someone mysteriously disables his restraints. I wonder if that'll be relevant later. Then he makes it off the Necromonger's ship, only to get recaptured by this asshole bounty hunter from the start of the movie. Wow, what are the odds of running into this particular guy again? Anyway, take one guess which planet they send him to. I'll give you a little clue, the sunrises are to die for. <laughs> Lucky they happen to take Riddick to the one place he needs to go to find Jack though. This guy's life is just swimming in conveniences. I love the totally useless flight computer here. Angle of approach. Not good. Could you give me more specific information? I mean, do I need to go up or down? Not good. Uh, I'll just take a guess, shall I? <laughs> anyway, Riddick goes into the prison and murders some people with a coffee cup because Vin Diesel, and reunites with Jack, who's now called Kira, and then they all escape when a deal between the bounty hunters and the prison guards goes south. See, the Necromongers are on their way to Crematoria, and the only way to escape the planet is the mercenary ship that's parked in a hangar like 10 miles away. Why is it so fucking far away from the prison? Don't know. The guards are already on their way there, so the only way to beat them is to take a shortcut across the surface before the sun comes up and incinerates them all. That's right, Riddick literally has to outrun the sun. <laughs> This entire sequence is absolute insanity. Like, if the entire surface of the planet gets scorched every single day, how is there even oxygen to breathe? Wouldn't the air be like 500 degrees Celsius, even on the dark side? Why does sunlight cause the ground to explode, but then stops just as it reaches our heroes? And why would you even construct a prison complex in such a ridiculously dangerous environment? Surely any unpopulated planet would accomplish the exact same thing. Anyway, they make it to the hangar, but then the neck Necromongers show up and kill everyone, and Carl Urban beats the shit out of Riddick and leaves him to die in the sun. Wait, I thought the sun was supposed to incinerate you instantly. But it's okay, because the guy who helped Riddick escaped earlier just so happens to be here, and he rescues him and explains that he's a Nick Furian as well. Well, that's lucky. Then he walks outside and vaporises himself because he's not Vin Diesel. Now I guess it's time for the big showdown. So Riddick returns to Diverse Paradise Planet to kill the Lord Marshal, but then Kira shows up and it turns out she's been converted into a necromonger as well. Oh no, I'm so shocked and saddened by this. And Vin Diesel tries to act all sad, but then he remembers he can't actually act, so it's time for another fight scene instead. And honestly, this is one of the laziest fight sequences I've seen since Batwoman. It's basically just Vin Diesel getting hit over and over again by a blurry CGI effect, until he falls over and the Lord Marshal tries to suck out his soul. But I guess there's too much Nick Fury in him, so he beats him up a bit more before Kira shows up and stabs him in the back. Wait, I thought she got converted into a necromonger. Uh, I guess it didn't work or something. I love how the rules of this movie literally change from moment to moment. But then the Lord Marshal punches her into a big spiky pillar, and Carl Urban tries to kill him, but he dodges straight into Riddick, who shoves a knife through his fucking head. And then everyone bows down to him, and I guess he's the new Lord Marshal now. Wow, the chain of command in this place is fucking mental, man. And the movie ends with Vin Diesel sitting on a throne, trying to act. And that's it, that's the plot for Chronicles of Riddick. Honestly, what a weird creative debacle of a film this is. It feels like two completely different movies awkwardly sandwiched together, and the transition between them is more jarring than teleporting from a Bel Air mansion into a Glasgow council estate. 
On the one hand, you've got a gritty action thriller that feels like a genuine sequel to Pitch Black. There's criminals, jailbreaks, corrupt mercenaries, and Vin Diesel killing people with tin cups. It's all a bit goofy at times, but it retains the grounded, believable world of the first movie. But then on the other hand, you've got this ridiculous sci-fi fantasy world of evil sorcerers, gothic spaceships, ancient prophecies, dark alternate universes, and Judy Dench floating through walls. It's completely bonkers, and despite its best efforts, the movie just can't find a way to mesh these two worlds together into a cohesive story. And it's so swimming in pompous, grandiose, over-the-top attempts at gravitas that it almost comes across as some kind of tongue-in-cheek parody, but it's not. This movie takes itself as serious as a heart attack, and somehow... That makes it even funnier. <laughs> the situation isn't exactly helped by Vin Diesel, who was always more of an image than an actor at the best of times. Pitch Black didn't ask him to do much more than run around looking big and burly, and his screen time was actually pretty limited. But now he has to carry the whole movie on his shoulders, and with nobody to hide behind, all it does is expose the fact that the guy can't fucking act. Watching him try to emote is like watching a man trying to squeeze out a particularly bulky turd. <laughs> Now don't get me wrong, it's good to try new things and take your franchise in unexpected directions, but I also think there's limits to how far you can shift things in the space of a single movie. It would be like having a Star Wars sequel that's a romantic comedy centred entirely around the staff and patrons of the Mos Eisley Cantina. It really feels like they wanted to make a completely standalone movie here, but they were forced to use Pitch Black as a jumping off point, so they threw in a few half-hearted references and retconned Riddick's story to make it fit in with the new narrative. And I can't quite shake the feeling that this whole movie was basically a hundred million dollar vanity project for Vin Diesel, who funnily enough was also the producer. See, it's easy to forget that he was once seriously tipped to be the next Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was big and buff and just about capable of saying words from a script. The difference is that Arnold had mad charisma that sustained his career long after his physique started to go, while Vin Diesel's got big muscles and... Well, not much else. But with Chronicles of Riddick, it's like he was out to prove there was more to him than the Fast and the Furious by turning Riddick into his own personal John Rambo. The problem is that the grounded characters and tight, gritty setting of the first movie was absolutely not compatible with this kind of grandiose, overblown space fantasy. As a result, Chronicles of Riddick just comes across as a weird Frankenstein's monster of wildly conflicting ideas, awkwardly stitched together into a movie that's too long, too fragmented, too self-indulgent, and too pretentious for anyone to buy into. It's a prime example of what happens when greed and ego and money takes priority over quality storytelling. And well, I can't say I'm surprised to be honest. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.